So the problem that we're solving says to determine the zeros of each polynomial function. And what that means is that we're going to find all the x values that make the polynomial equal 0. So to do this for this first one, we're going to factor by grouping, which means that we're going to find the factors of the first and last term's product that when added, their sum is going to be the middle term. So first let's find the product of the leading coefficient and the constant, which is going to be x to the power of 4 times 36, and that equals 36x to the power of 4. Then the two factors of this that are going to have a sum of negative 13x squared are going to be negative 9x squared and negative 4x squared. So then we can just put that right in as a difference of negative 13. So x to the power of 4 minus 4x squared minus 9x squared plus 36. Okay, now we're going to find the greatest common factor of the first two terms, which is going to be x squared, leaving us with x squared minus 4. And for the last two terms, it's going to be negative 9, which gives x squared minus 4 as well. And since there's two x squared minus 4s, we can factor that out, which gives us x squared minus 9 and x squared minus 4. So as you can see, the format that these are in is that of the difference of squares, which is going to be like this, a squared minus b squared, and it'll equal to a minus b and a plus b. So following that, what we'll get from x squared minus 9 when we expand it will be x minus 3 and x plus 3. Then for x squared minus 4, we will get x minus 2 and x plus 2. So now that we have these factors, we'll let each one equal 0, and those will be the zeros of the polynomial. So for x minus 3 equals 0, x will equal 3. Then for x plus 3 equals 0, x will equal negative 3. Then for x minus 2 equals 0, x will equal 2. Then for x plus 2 equals 0, x will equal negative 2. Therefore, the zeros um, of this polynomial are 3, negative 3, 2, and negative 2, and we'll box the final answer. Now we're going to find the zeros of this polynomial function, and in order to factor by grouping as we did previously, I'm going to have to factor out the common factor that each term in this polynomial shares. And that is going to be x. So once we factor out x, what we'll have is 6x to the power of 4 minus 7x squared minus 3. And now we can factor by grouping. So we're going to have to multiply the first and last term, 6x to the power of 4 times negative 3, which will equal negative 18x to the power of 4. So now we're going to have to find two numbers whose product will be negative 18x to the power of 4 and whose sum will be negative 7x squared. So two numbers who will do that are negative 9x squared and 2x squared. Then we're going to put those into the equation as a difference of negative 7x. So it's going to be 6x to the power of 4 plus 2x squared minus 9x squared minus 3. And then we're going to take the greatest common factor from the first two terms and from the last two terms. So for the first two terms, it's going to be 2x squared, which leaves us with 3x squared plus 1. And for the last two terms, it's going to be negative 3, which leaves us with 3x squared plus 1. Now, since there's two 3x squared plus 1s, we can factor out 3x squared plus 1. So what that leaves us with is x, and then in the brackets, 2x squared minus 3 and 3x squared plus 1. So now these are the three factors of the polynomial. I'm going to let the factors equal to 0 and solve for x. So this one is x equals 0. Then 2x squared minus 3 equals 0. We're going to bring the 3 to the other side. And then we're going to divide both sides by 2 and take the square root of both sides. So it's going to be positive or minus root 3 over 2. And that's because both positive or negative root 3 over 2, put in this equation as x, will equal 0. So, yeah. And then we're going to do 3x squared plus 1 equals 0. We're going to put the 1 to the other side and divide both sides by 3. Take the square root of both sides and we get x equals root negative 1 over 3. And this is not a 0 because you can't take the square root of a negative number. Therefore, the zeros of this polynomial are positive root 3 over 2, negative root 
50 over 2, and 0. State whether each function is even, odd, or neither. So this is an even degree function because the exponent of each term of the function is even, 4 and 2. Therefore, it will satisfy the property f of negative x equals f of x. And now we're just going to substitute a negative x into the equation. So negative x to the power of 4 minus 13 um, multiplied by negative x squared plus 36 just to see if it satisfies that property. Um, so we're, we have a negative base raised to an even power, which is going to equal a positive. So x to the power of 4, positive x to the power of 4, and then minus 13, positive x squared plus 36. And as you can see, f of x equals f of negative x. Therefore, um, function is even. This is an odd degree function because the exponent of each term in the equation is odd, x to the power of 5, x to the power of 3, and x to the power of 1. Therefore, it's going to satisfy the property g of negative x equals negative g of x, and we're going to prove that algebraically. So g of negative x, we're going to substitute negative x into the equation. So 6 times negative x to the power of 5 minus 7 times x. Um, negative x to the power of 3 minus 3 times negative x and the answer to that is going to be negative x to the power of 5 plus 7x cubed plus 3x as so. Then we're going to do negative g of x which is going to be the entire equation times negative 1. So it's just going to be everything to the opposite sign of what it currently is. So it's going to be negative 6x to the power of 5 plus 7x cubed plus 3x as so. And g of negative x equals negative g of x. So therefore, this function is odd. I'm going to sketch a graph for this function. And what we already know I've written down from the previous questions, the x-intercepts are negative 3, negative 2, 3, 2. The y-intercept is 36 because when you let x equal 0, you can see that f of x will be 36. And the order is 1 because when we factored it, all the factors were to the power of 1. The end behavior, since it's to an even degree and it's a positive leading coefficient, it's going to extend from quadrant 2 to 1. And its ends are going to extend infinitely. So since this graph looks like this, it's only going to have an absolute minimum. And um, to find the absolute maximum minimum, local maximum minimum, it's the same technique every single time. So I'm only going to do it once for one of the absolute minimums of this graph. And I'll do the rest behind the scenes. So um, to do that, we're going to find the midpoint between the x-intercept. The ones I've chosen are negative 3 and negative 2. So we're going to use the equation of m equals x1 plus x2 over 2. And then we're going to add negative 3 plus negative 2 over 2, which will equal negative 2.5. Then we're going to just insert that into the equation as x to find the y value of the absolute minimum. And that's going to give us negative 6.25. And then the rest of the, the next absolute minimum, since it's symmetrical on the y-axis, it's going to be 2.5 and 6.25. To negative 6.25 and there's also a local maximum which I found earlier using this equation and it's the y-intercept so now that we know those points we're just gonna plot them so this is the x-intercept that I'm plotting as so and 2 comma 0 and 3 comma 0 and then the local um, maximum which is gonna be right here the y-intercept and that's 0, 36. And we're going to get the absolute minimums, which are negative 2.5, comma, negative 6.25, and 2.5, comma, negative 6.25. Uh, so, and we know since it's even, it's going to be symmetrical on the y-axis. And we know the end behavior, it's going to look like this. So we're just going to go down here because we know that since the orders of the x-intercepts are 1, instead of bouncing off, it's going to change signs at the x-intercept. So it's just going to go right through, and now it has to go back up and change the sign again, and it's going to go up through to the local maximum, and now it has to go change the sign again, and it has to go back up, and it'll continue infinitely this way. So this is the rough graph.
So I'm going to sketch the graph for this function, and we know the x-intercepts from earlier, but I put them in decimal form so I can graph, so it's negative 1.225, positive 1.225, and the origin 0, 0. The y-intercept is when x equals 0, so it's the same as the x-intercept, 0, 0. The type is odd, which means that it's going to have point symmetry on the origin, and the end behavior, since it's a positive leaning coefficient with an odd degree, it's going to extend from quad 3 to 1 and it's going to have an end behavior looking like this. So the order of the x-intercepts is also 1, we found that earlier, and I used the same method as previously to find the local max and local min, just the midpoint between the x-intercepts. There's no absolute maximum or minimum because it extends infinitely like that. I'm going to start by plotting all the points we know, like the x-intercepts, so there's negative 1.225, 0, and positive 1.225, 0, and the origin, which is also the y-intercept, and then a local minimum, which is right here, and it's 0 0.6125, comma, negative 2.93, and the local maximum, which is 0, negative 0 0.6125, comma, 2.93. Know how the end behavior is, and we're just gonna put the arrow so that we can connect the points more easily. So we're gonna start in quadrant three, and then we're gonna go up towards the x-intercept, where we're gonna have to change signs, and then we're gonna have to go up towards the local maximum, and then down towards the x-intercept, where we have to change signs because of the order being one, and we go down towards the local minimum, and we go up to the next x-intercept, where we once again have to change signs. And then we just go up infinitely this way, and this is the graph for this function.